There are times when the only way to survive is to forage, to find food in the wild, wherever you can find it. But it takes special knowledge. There are many, many times in history when we look at different journals in the 18th century and we find people that at the edge of survival have to go out and find their food. Somebody like Nicholas Cresswell or the Lewis and Clark expedition. They are in the worst kind of circumstances. Maybe they're at the end of winter and there's no real food left. Or they're in the wilderness and they're traveling or they're exploring and they're out of supplies. You read about this over and over again. And that last bit of energy they use to find food that will sustain them until they get to civilization. Foraging is an interesting kind of word that I think sometimes we can have a hard time really narrowing in on and understanding its true meaning. Many times in the 18th century, forage was used for the military. And when they foraged, it was basically pillaging. They had to get supplies and they would just kind of break into farms and take what they needed. Sometimes they would pay for those supplies, other times not so much. And there was official foraging and unofficial foraging. We have people like Joseph Plum Martin. He occasionally just has to go and steal to survive. Maybe we could call it gleaning in the fields. He would just go to the edge of a field and you know take a few pumpkins, whatever it took so that he could survive. He wasn't taking them to sell them. He just needed to eat something. And then other kinds of foraging, that's where you're finding the bounty in the wild. You go out into the woods, you go out into the meadows, and you find what food there is. Sometimes it's greens, maybe it's tubers, something like a wild carrot, and you'll survive upon that. Right now is a perfect example. It's spring outside and things are just starting to get green. The weather gets warm and it feels great, but it's in fact the hardest time of year for some people on the frontier because they are out of supplies and yet what's out there isn't gonna give them anything. They, they haven't planted any crops yet. There's nothing there to harvest, to eat, and what they have left over from winter is either run out or it's bad. It's gone bad by now, especially with the warmer weather. So you think winter's the hardest, spring is actually the hardest time of year. Now there are times when we forage today and we usually forage today for delicacies, something like a morel mushroom. But the kind of foraging that we're usually talking about in the 18th century is survival foraging. And therefore what you're trying to get there is actual sustaining food. And it might not be pleasant. It might not be even palatable at times, but it's what you truly need to survive. Who cares about one tiny yummy mushroom when you're going to starve to death and you need to fill your stomach and actually have something that's truly nutritious? Hekka Welder is talking about living in this very, very difficult primitive frontier situation and he has plenty of fish, but he says, ooh, they're totally impalatable and it's not food that can sustain the body. And so he survives upon nettles, something that is much more nutritious. Not something necessarily good to eat, but something that can truly sustain the body. How do we prepare our foraged foods? There are times when the best kind of foraged food is something we don't need to prepare at all. We can eat it raw, even if it might be unpalatable, but most things are gonna get cooked at least a little bit. Usually in a foraging situation, we have only the simplest cooking tools. So can we boil it? Can we fry it? While some things you can eat right away, maybe even raw, there are other things that you forage that unless they're prepared in just the right way, are actually poisonous. So you need kind of special knowledge for that. And that brings us to that idea of special knowledge. Foraging is all about information and knowledge about where you're at and what there is available. We get to this great example of Sacagawea with the Lewis and Clark expedition. They couldn't survive that entire trip, even though they had all these supplies and all these equipment, they couldn't survive without the specialized knowledge that she had. Not only was she able to talk to the Native Americans and translate for them, but she had the knowledge to understand what they could forage in the land and survive upon when there was no hunting and there were no supplies available. 
There was one point where they needed to decide where to camp for a long-term camp for winter before they left to come back. They used her knowledge to locate their camp in the right location so that they would have forage materials right next to them. So they would have a special kind of tuber that grew in the ground that she knew about that they had no idea. Without that knowledge, they wouldn't have been able to survive. Another great example of this specialized knowledge is Nicholas Cresswell as he goes into the wilderness on his second trip. And he is going to trade with the Native Americans. He gets separated from his guide and he's alone and he loses his horse. He doesn't have any real supplies with him, but he runs into a couple of Native Americans and they help him. They find his lost horse and they give him food. They didn't have any trouble finding what it took to survive in the world around them. They were completely away from civilization or any kind of camp, but they knew exactly what it took to survive. When it comes to foraging, each region has its own specialty. And right here, nettles are one of the most prolific things at this time of year. Right now, if you go outside, almost everything is still brown, but we have just a few green things popping up. Some of those are highly nutritious, and stinging nettles are one of those things. Stinging nettles were highly popular in Europe at the time, mostly for medicine, but they used them for other purposes too. And here, they're the perfect food in early March. A great example of using nettles is Heckewelder, and he is traveling in the backcountry of Pennsylvania. He is traveling in the middle of the 18th century, and he's a missionary, and he wants to be a mission to these Native Americans, but they don't want him to set down roots there. They're worried about people settling in the frontier. They allow him only a piece of ground, 50 paces by 50 paces to have his garden, and they have to figure out how to survive in that location with that much ground. And it's not even good ground to grow in, it's actually a forest, so they have to cut down the trees. So they know there is absolutely no way they can survive on that piece of ground. So he has to forage. There are no locations that he can get supplies from that are close to him. And so he has to survive on the wilderness. We live mostly on nettles, which grew abundantly in the bottoms and of which we frequently made two meals a day. We also made use of some other vegetables and greens. That's what they're living on nothing but stinging nettles. So what's the classic way to cook something like a whole bunch of greens that you have here, nettles or maybe dandelion? And as I go looking through the cookbooks in the 18th century and before, you don't necessarily find a nettle soup recipe. That's not something people are generally talking about in a fancy cookbook that we have in our time period. But we do have many, many interesting examples of medicinal and just plain sustaining broths. We'll take a meat, maybe a beef, and we boil that and then chop up our herbs, very fine, our greens, and put them into boil. And there are different recipes here they talk about. It's like, well, you know, use what greens you have available. And they give you this list of 20 or 30 different kinds of herbs to use. And nettles are one of them, and so are dandelions. I'm gonna be making a wonderful sustaining broth today. I'm gonna to take about a gallon of water and maybe a half a pound of beef. We're gonna use this wonderful 17th century recipe where he talks about using as much chopped up oatmeal as we have herbs and to chop these herbs up very, very small. What we want this to do is break down completely. So it begins to be a very thick broth and we have a thick broth with our herbs and our oatmeal and then some little chunks of meat. I'm always amazed when I dig into these readings about how much perseverance, how much struggle there was and how they pushed through. It's, I think it's something we can all take a lesson from. So let's find out how our broth turned out. So the greens are hanging out here. They did not break up as much as some of the recipes called for, but I didn't want to cut them up until they disappeared. We've got a little bit of the oatmeal. You don't need a lot and it really thickens it up. We just boiled it up until it got the right kind of thickness. Of course, the beef looks uh, plenty done here. And really that's just the, the extra part. The important part, that's the greens. So let's find out. 
you know, you would think that stinging nettles would be distasteful, that they would be bad. And it turns out that in this context, they are really, really good. You know, after tasting this, I can see why Heckewelder was eating nettles twice a day and enjoying it.